I'm Andrea, a pastor, DE advocate, and consultant on a mission. Join me in each episode as we celebrate diversity, ignite conversations, and craft workplaces and educational institutions where everyone thrives. This podcast is my commitment to making a meaningful impact on the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So are you ready? Let's get diversity. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Get Diversity podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Horton Marichli, founder of Diversity DEI Consulting and a passionate DEI advocate and ally. This episode is all about everyday equity and how it is easier than we think to create equitable opportunities for everyone. My guest today is Matisse Wilbin. Uh, pardon me, Dr. Matisse Wilbin. <laughs> I want to be respectful of titles. Um, she is a TEDx speaker who uses her 18 years of experience as a sociologist and 10 years as a diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist to help institutions understand the power of equity. Formerly a tenured associate professor, she taught university courses centered around race and ethnicity and structural inequality. Dr. Wilbin has a unique way of communicating her scholarship practically uh, practically to all her audiences. In addition to teaching, um, so she's a very busy uh, professional, (laughs) in addition to teaching, Dr. (laughs) Wilbin is an active researcher. I love research. Uh, She conducts research on inequality, fatherhood, family dynamics, and youth outcomes, and has published extensively in these areas. Dr. Wilbin is the CEO of Wilbin Enterprises. We, a consulting firm specializing in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, or DEIB, strategic planning and training for universities and nonprofits across the country. She travels extensively consulting, customizing, and implementing DEIB plans that move organizations from awareness to action. Dr. Open is a sought after speaker. Her most recent talk, entitled Good Grief, has garnered thousands of views. It highlights the idea that many circumstances in life bring grief, but that grief can be a gift. In short, there is good in grief. She is currently preparing her second TEDx talk that will be given in June 2024, and she will uh, be able to give more details at the end um, or during our podcast today. Uh, She is an empowerment speaker and has traveled extensively speaking to to, uh, four corporations, uh, nonprofits, college campuses, and leadership groups across the country. So with that, welcome Dr. Matisse Wilbin to the Get Diversity podcast. Thank you for being our guest speaker today. Thank you so much for having me. When you're reading them, like, who is she talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you ever do that? You're like, wow. Yeah, you're like, you start turning red. It's like, did I write, did I say that? <laughs> did I do that? <laughs> yes, but thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk yeah. to you. Me too. I'm excited to talk to you too. Um, and I was uh, just honored when you reached out to me uh, to uh, inquire about being on the podcast. Um, so why don't you tell the, the listeners a little bit more about yourself um, and this concept of everyday equity and how it involves recognizing and valuing the humanity and dignity of all individuals, mm-hmm. regardless of differences? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, as you kind of mentioned in the bio, um, um, initially an academic, so I was in the classroom full time for the the very front part of my profession professional life. And what I discovered is that when we're when we're talking about inequality, whether it's research or I was talking to students, uh, I would always hearken back to like growing up in Kentucky. I'm from Kentucky, from mm-hmm. Appalachia, yes. and you know I thought this term equity is so today so polarizing. It's so mm-hmm. politicized. But when I think back to when I grew up um, as a young girl in Kentucky, equity really was about how we could take care of our neighbor. There was yeah. there was humanity in the fact that a neighbor might have to come and borrow some sugar from me, and, and I gave it to them freely, not thinking about privilege, not thinking mm-hmm. about whether, you know, what does that mean for me? Am I going to have enough sugar? No, my neighbor was in need, right? Yeah. Because often it was because they didn't have the same starting place. They didn't have the same resources. Many of them, you know, had various challenges that they were trying to overcome Mm -hmm. and they were looking for someone who had uh, a way to give them access and opportunities to be able to to give it to them. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this concept of everyday equity really came as I was thinking about what's 
missing, right? What's missing in our conversations about equity? Obviously, policies and practices and all of those things are super important when it comes to um, DEIB, but I think we've taken the humanity out. So like, I'm like, let's add the EQ. Let's add the emotional intelligence back into this idea of equity, you know? Yes. And so- And so in short, the term everyday equity sort of came to mind. I thought, that's it. If we have this lens every day, personally, professionally, from the supermarket to the boardroom, it would it would create naturally, um, in my opinion, this idea that I need to sort of help those around me so that it doesn't have to be, you know, can we dismiss this or not? Can we get rid of this program or not? It's about no matter what space I hold, that I'm holding it for others as well as for myself. I love that. Um, When what you were saying with uh, being like almost like human centered and emotional Mm -hmm. intelligence, I am all about emotional intelligence because in order to be empathetic, you need to have a higher um, EQ. And uh, so you you can uh, recognize not only your own um, feelings and emotions, uh, but others as well. Um, and to me, every all interactions, everyday interactions, regardless of who you're interacting with, it's all about being human-centered. Start with the human. It doesn't matter what they look like, where they're from, what language they may, uh, may be uh, speaking as um, mm-hmm. their first language. It doesn't matter. Um, because as humans, we're all alike. We want the same, a lot of the same things. We want to be accepted for who we are we want to be uh loved we want to be mm-hmm. valued we want to be heard we want to be mm-hmm. seen for our awesome. whole who we are as a whole and eq really helps with that uh like i i love daniel goleman and his uh his mm-hmm. books i i subscribe to his newsletters on linkedin too it's like um mm-hmm. anything about eq i i love and i i'm all about and uh, humor centric, uh, human centered approaches as well. So I love Absolutely. that concept that you came up with everyday equity. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And 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 I will just add this too. You know, when we think about equity work, DEI work in general, DEI work, there's always this conversation like, are you making the moral case or are you making the business case, right? Yeah. And the reality is, when I think about everyday equity, it's both and. It's not either or. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's a morality. It is the right thing to do. But when you do the right thing, I believe you get the right results, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. so whether you're a business, you know, we don't, sometimes I think when we think about the business case, we sort of put this capitalist sort of perspective in there where it's like, I'm only going to do this because I'm making, you know, my company more money. Um, and I understand it. There's a bottom line there. But when you think about how both of those things go together, the the richest, most, um, you know, the, the, the companies that are the richest aren't just rich in dollars. They're rich in culture. They're rich in experience. They're rich in engagement. Um, and so that's what I think we really should get back to. I agree, because money alone, uh, for most people anyway, doesn't make you happy without um, the humanness. Uh, uh, without including human uh, humanness and, and other people around you. And in order for other people to want to be around you, you have to um, value them and listen to them and, and, um, and be that inclusive servant leader um, with high EQ because people know uh, you're in organizations, your teams will know if uh, your heart's really in it, or if it is just about the bottom line, that uh, profit margin for you, which is, um, a positive uh, side effect um, or result of mm-hmm. uh, having a great DEIB, um, DEIBA, DEIBJ um, in yeah. your organizations um, because happier employees <laughs> um, produce, you know, they, they work, it's not work to them when, when they're happy and they enjoy uh, what they do and the environment they're in with uh, working with the people that are on their teams. So absolutely. Yeah. And I even saw that um, in my students. Right. So Mm -hmm. I took this approach. I I wasn't thinking about the concept in the same way that I am now, but I realized that my students were whole people. Right. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in the in the classroom, their students, I was the professor. It was about getting the grades. But Mm -hmm. I noticed that my students performed better when I saw them as a whole individual, Mm -hmm. when I acknowledged 
you know, that they're in a number of different roles. When I acknowledge that many of them were working long hours, when I acknowledge that maybe I needed to have after hours, um, office hours for students mm-hmm. who, you know, work a lot. And so, yeah. you know, it's, it's the same concept that I feel like I've been living, um, but, but sort of just developing it more in this particular work. But my students did better, right? When mm-hmm. I acknowledged, you know, who they were as a person, and um, impacted them accordingly, right? Created resources accordingly. Same concept. Yeah, it is the same concept. And um, I'm glad Mm -hmm. you brought education into the the, um, conversation because um, DEI is not just about work organizations. It's about, um, as you had said, education, no, ed- educational mm-hmm. institutions, classrooms, um, and also before the podcast, you had mentioned the community at large. Um, it's about okay. everywhere people are. That's where DEI okay. should be happening. Um, and when I was a teacher, um, I taught, I originally taught special education in middle school and loved it, loved it. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people don't like the middle school age, but I loved it. You never knew who was walking <laughs> through the door that day with those hormones going all over the place. <laughs> Uh, kept you on your toes. Um, but um, my students would often tell me, why do you care so much? Uh, because I worked in low income schools. I grew up in low income schools and I wanted to uh, be a resource for the students at, at the same types of schools I grew up in. Um, mm-hmm. Because I know that um, uh, a lot of these students don't have um, uh, someone who's uh, there to encourage them like uh, or um, uh advocate for them and their needs so um and uh and just encourage them to do their best and be their best and start from mm-hmm. a, a clean slate um because a lot of teachers and, and this is at the k-12 level i don't know um i'm assuming i don't want to assume but I'm, I'm assuming um that it's the same at the the uh, higher education level uh with professors they they hear stories from other uh instructors about, oh, you, you have that person in your class, oh, be careful, you know, and so uh, they get, um, for lack of a better word, infected by somebody else's um, perceived experiences with that individual, and Absolutely. they let them make up their mind for them, and so that individual is already starting, you know, in a negative um, uh, lens with that, that instructor, so I always, um, and I, I realized how much of a problem it was when I did uh, start teaching in these schools because it made me think, you know, I'm it, they, um, the same thing must have been happening in my schools. <laughs> I didn't see it because I was one of the, the better students, but um, it, it must have been, you know, going on because um, when I got to university, I struggled like there was no tomorrow. Uh, I mm-hmm. thought, you know, I um, had the best education, uh, but I realized, no, maybe I didn't. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so I really pushed my kids, um, in these schools to, um, to work beyond what the, um, uh, the curriculum limited them to, and they loved it and, mm-hmm. uh, and they mm-hmm. excelled. So, and, oh my goodness, you're, you're making me think of so much. I, I love that <laughs> example because, because it wasn't that there was something inherently wrong, right. With your students. Yeah. It was just there was a needed resource. Mm-hmm. And some of those resources were, you know, maybe in um, supplies. Mm-hmm. Some of it was inspiration. Some of it was just a recognition yes. of the barriers and battles that they faced. Mm-hmm. So that on one hand, you're helping to remove those barriers, but you're motivating and equipping them to remove them themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that's a missing piece, even in the the DEI space, because it becomes so polarizing where people are like, well, you know, it's about, you know, giving all of these resources to these marginalized groups. And we're just going to, you know, and and this whole idea of privilege and who should get it and who shouldn't. And, And I think what you just gave is a really beautiful example to me in terms of the way that I think about this work that it's about removing those barriers that we don't have, we being whoever those marginalized voices are, mm-hmm. don't have the power to remove, but also giving folks the power, giving them the mm-hmm. access, giving them the opportunities to also remove them themselves. And when we do that, and and there is shared, shared power in that way, it just produces something I've seen in my own experience working with organizations 
it produces something that everybody wants. Yeah. If we could just see the picture before we get there, it's something that everybody would want if we, you know, if we just kind of stopped and, and really thought about it. Yeah. And stop using labels and things like that to define things. Um, that, a lot of that is uh, the labels and stuff are what um, the ones who are um, not understanding DEI or against DEI or hesitant, like, why do we need this? Um, mm -hmm. That's part of why they're hesitant because um, they see labels and uh, for humans, um, automatically we, we just assume the worst labels are negative, you know, mean something mm -hmm. bad. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and um, it starts, it, it's related to our stereotypes and our emphasis Absolutely. biases. So. Absolutely. Uh, Yep. Yeah. So um, when it comes to demystifying equity, um, mm -hmm. the, um, the, uh, the notion that creating equitable opportunities is, a, um, sorry, um, sorry about that. Um, in your experience, what are some common misconceptions or barriers to understanding and promoting equity? Well, I think one of the big ones is just people not knowing the difference between equity and equality. That's yes. that's the first off the bat, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, oh, you hit it on the head. That... Podcast <laughs> over. Okay. <laughs> Listen, you do the work. I do the work. We, you know, we get it. It's that's that's a big part of it. People really understanding um, that equality is about giving everybody sort of the same thing, but equity is really trying to understand where everyone is starting, and mm -hmm. and it is this awareness that, um, as you were talking about. And I say that I used to say this in a lot of my classes, and I talk about it as I work with my clients now. Um, the reality is, all education isn't equal, right? Yes. That's that's part of the reason why we're here. Just because you're a part of a, you know, a school, all schools are not created equal. So when you, what you know, I thought think about this with students coming into my classroom, and I talk about this with CEOs, with employees that are coming into their organization thinking about what the starting place is for the people with whom you're working and taking those things into account. I'll give you a quick example again of something that happened to me. And this is kind of why I left. I didn't leave academia. I teach part-time, but why I really wanted to work with organizations. I had a student um, connected to him to this day. He was actually, he had cerebral palsy and he was in a wheelchair. Talked to him every single day after class, every single day after class. Brilliant mind. You know, he just had a lot of questions. I love those kinds of students. And I say to him, let's continue this conversation in my office. He's like, okay, cool. So he, um, you know, goes to the elevator so he could go downstairs. I walk down the steps and go meet him. I was going to my office and it took so long. I'm like, where is he? Well, he had gotten stuck around the corner because there were all of these chairs in the hallway leading to my office and it was very narrow. So I made an assumption that he would be able to easily get to my office. He's a student. Yeah. He's a bright student, right? Mm -hmm. But there was some, there was a starting point. There was a place, there was a resources that he needed that perhaps mm -hmm. other students did not need, did not need. Yeah. And so once I realized that, of course, we took the chairs out so that they were no longer there. Yeah. Because so it's, it it's also a fire hazard. Sorry. It's a fire hazard, mm -hmm. so many different things. Yeah. But until that student's need brought it to my attention, mm -hmm. I was thinking all of the student, all of my students have the same access to me. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that example, and that probably happened, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago now, that has, has stayed with me because I thought I, I want every student to have the same access to me. I was mortified. Mm -hmm. And of course, I apologized. He was great. I use that example because that happens within organizations every single day. And it mm -hmm. might not be as, you know, it might not be as um, visible, if you will, but, mm -hmm. but there are either conversations to be had or resources that are needed for mental health and other things that mm -hmm. create access for all. Right, that create opportunities for all. So it really is about understanding what equity is. And I think if we could get past that point, then some real decisions can be made to move to action. I agree. I agree. And and, and I love that you uh, brought up that example because until 
and for you, it wasn't like personal, but it, it happened to you. So, uh, but it reminded me of like um, uh, politicians and all this legislation that's happening and all um, people, there's a lot of people out there that just assume everybody has equal access until it becomes personal. Um, and that, that there's That's nothing right. wrong. It's like, well, you know, why are you complaining? You know, you're just uh, um, uh, whining and stuff. Everybody has the same uh, act, um, yeah. opportunities. You're just not working hard. You're lazy. Um, or you just yes. didn't really, you didn't really want to come uh, or go to go yeah. to that place. Um, but you couldn't, as your, your student um, experience, he couldn't access it. So um, I do see a lot more like organizations and um, even like the airports and stuff. It's all like even the restrooms, like there's no doors because right. um, how many restaurants have you been in where it's still a manual and they don't have the button option and, and the, right. some of the handles are high, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so um, it's, uh, it's not accessible that restroom and therefore that restaurant isn't accessible for the entire population e equally accessible to everyone in the community right. and um and even like uh speaking of restrooms like the baby change stations automatically yes. assume oh it's in the women's but you have single fathers you have uh fathers who are um caring for their their children and their their spouse um is working right. um you know and like where are they going to change their children <laughs> if they can't walk that's into right. the women's restroom um so that's why I love those, like the concepts of uh, gender neutral and mm -hmm. um, and also the the family uh, restroom option as well. Um, yeah. Can, so. can I give you another example? I think that's so sure. good. Two things real quick. So the other thing about everyday equity that, that I think is important is what we did for one ended up doing for all. Yeah. Right. One student. But now it makes it makes the, an awareness for everybody. Now everybody is going to have access because we chose, you know, we, we took care of the needs of the one student. And for me, that again, sort of points back to this idea that it, you know, it doesn't have to be the entire organization, even if it's just yeah. one person, yeah. that recognition and change is going to impact everybody. The last thing that I'll say is I was working with an, um, an organization, an arts organization, um, it was a museum and they had a display. They had a um, someone come in to do a display. And the whole point was to talk about ex um, accessibility of art. And they were talking about how this, this person, the, the artist actually was in a wheelchair. So everything, you know, all of the art was, he made it at, at eye level. The person made it at eye level on purpose. Mm -hmm. purpose. And actually, it wasn't just eye level. It was just, you know, different places. Some were yeah. his eye level. Some were talking. So we were, they were talking about how amazing the display was and the, the exhibit. And we were like, oh, this is fantastic. And then I was like, you know, I have a question. When that exhibit, you know, left that particular, your museum, did you then change all of the art? So they, they were at different eye levels and they were like, no, <laughs> we didn't <laughs> think about that. Yeah. So the point that I'm making again, again, in terms of accessibility it was a momentary thing that was done. Everybody, you know, applauded because a, a point was made, but the long-term impact wasn't sustained. And that's yeah. what I see often with clients that I work with. They don't really start with the end in mind. So they're okay with a program here or there, or, you know, maybe, maybe a DEI assessment of the organization. Um, but then don't really have things in place and evaluations to make sure that it's sustained. So I think that's another important point. Yeah, definitely. Um, that continuous or not continue, but um, periodic um, uh, assessments and measuring uh, data, you know, um, and getting input from those that are actually involved, which are the people in the organization or um, or the customers um, to see if um, things have actually sustained are working the way they're supposed to work. Um, Cause you know, we can have the best uh, intentions in mind and it does, it flops, you know, <laughs> we're not going to know Absolutely. unless we get that, <laughs> that information. <laughs> we think it's going fine, you know, cause we might be like hybrid or remote or, you know, we're not, we're not on that floor. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, because as you know, a lot of people, 
a lot of employees have um, there's a, a fear of spe speaking up to leadership. Uh, there's a fear sure. of being reprimanded or um, fired or <laughs> whatever, or just not heard or taken seriously, or um, being uh, if you're um, a, one of the marginalized populations, or maybe not even of the marginalized population, you're afraid of uh, uh, being like uh, uh, called like oh you're just uh, overreacting or being set to, uh, told you're overreacting. I cannot talk today. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, no, I got you. I got you. <laughs> and um, so it, it never verbally happens. So when these surveys and assessments um, and usually you get better or you usually yeah always get better um, input and data when it's from a third party outside of the organization uh, than yes. um, internal because there, there's still a way of like connecting an email to something or um, right. so employees may not be as honest for internal surveys as they would be for a survey done by an external third um, uh, party that it, um, is, uh, what's the word I'm um, looking for that is unbiased, but, and um, anonymous. Oh, I, not anonymous, but uh, um, pardon me? No, I was trying to, I was thinking, oh, I'm thinking like, like Switzerland question. was Switzerland in World War II. What's the word? Oh my gosh. Um, now it's like at the tip of my tongue. I know <laughs> it's like right there. <laughs> it's like I was even thinking about it earlier today. Um, like they, they don't, they're not on either side. <laughs> yeah, neutral, neutral, neutral. There we go. Yes, <laughs> Woo, there's the R. <laughs> we got it. We got it. Yes, <laughs> so yeah, they tend to be more honest, uh, with a neutral third party. So who yeah who, I'm just, uh, just working with yeah. a, I was just working with an or you just made me think about I was working with an organization actually in Baltimore <clears throat> and we did that very thing so the organization hired a third party um contracted with a company who did that they had anonymous surveys and it was great because what they did was they identified a couple of um areas that that you know the organization needed to work on organization wide and it impacted all groups but it particularly um you know really hit um marginalized groups and and i think the i think the one that stood out was and you made me think about it because it was something like the inability not having the power to speak up like that was their mm -hmm. main focus yeah. and what was great about it was that information, um, they use that to create programming and focus groups. And so I was able to come in as a consultant and help nice. with, you know, you know, how to kind of combat that and deal with it. And I thought it was a really nice marriage because to your point, people, it was a really good return rate. So a lot of people felt comfortable. They felt like it was anonymous and they could get either department wide or organizational wide data back. And I thought yes. that was such a, that's really a good way, I think, to, to you know, um, yeah. do some of not, this work. Exactly. Because it doesn't single uh, one person out. It's like, okay, 80% of the people in the finance department answered this way. 5% uh, answered this pay way. You know, it's like, they're not going to see anything. And because everything, as you said, is it's piecemeal to, uh, together in a, the and the output to the organization's leadership. Um, so it's, um, yeah, fully anonymous. Because uh, that mm -hmm. third party, uh, even though they can probably see what email was associated with with it, that nothing like that is included in those um, reports. Um, Absolutely. So let's go on to uh, community building and neighborliness. Um, how does fostering yeah. a sense of community and neighborliness contribute to promoting equity and inclusion in um, your con in the concept of everyday equity? So the concept of everyday equity, being able to build community really is everything. It, it's being able to, it, it increases engagement. It increases levels of trust. Um, it increases cross-communication. Cross um, it's not to say, you know, of course, that everything is perfect, but it creates a culture of inclusivity. And for me, again, if I hearken back to this idea of growing up in Appalachia, when I talk about my neighbors, um, I didn't even know them all. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm not, of course, it's a small town, but it just was this idea that if you're from this area, if I think about my community or my town as an organization, mm -hmm. if you were from 
from that area, that that membership alone, because there is a trust in in our living in you know commonality and, and having some commonality, mm-hmm. it just made me want to be able to reach out and help. And I think if we build that again within these organizations, then um, we can come to work as our full selves yeah. and not be penalized for it. But in fact, it creates more engagement, right? I've been, I'm doing a little bit of work around Renee Brown's concept of vulnerability and yeah. doing some, yeah. And um, actually was in some conversations yesterday about it. And so talking at, to, a, to a group of people who um, you know represent marginalized groups, if you will, mm-hmm. and we were talking about like, how does that show up for you? And what does that mean for you? And yeah. there's some fear. There's some fear for some people because they feel like if they show up as their whole selves, if they are are vulnerable, mm-hmm. that it will work against them. Yeah. I for me, everyday equity is the complete opposite of that. It invites, it gives us permission because when I can when I can fully see you as my neighbor, doesn't mean I know everything. Doesn't mean you have to give me your entire life, mm-hmm. right? But my lens is to make this community stronger. I'm going to do what's necessary to make you stronger as an individual. And that is community building, community engagement, again, building those areas of trust, learning to resolve conflict, learning to communicate better. All of that plays into um, this concept of everyday equity. I love that. Um, As you were talking, um, it made me think of, um, as I told you before, I I lived and worked overseas. in uh, Europe, M- Middle East area, and um, culture plays a big part in uh, how someone uh, portrays himself to the community and to their family. Um, uh-huh. So there are some cultures where it is um, really seen as, I mean, there's a lot of con bad consequences um if someone comes out as lgbtq plus Uh um or um or divorces uh um like if they have if their their spouse is or partner is um abusing them and they they leave i mean there's a lot of uh repercussions when it comes to certain cultures so uh, when it comes to everyday equity i'm just curious um in the United States anyway, if when there's uh, someone from a different culture uh, mm-hmm. from another country um, and they're having a difficult time being their whole s- authentic selves, even to their family, uh, what would you recommend? Uh, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, <laughs> um, but what would you recommend to that individual? Yeah, I think that's a tough one. I think it's a tough one. This is what I would say generally, and this is what I believe. Maybe it's Pollyanna. um, And I'll tell you an example. (laughs) I've been called that before too. (laughs) Listen, the world is so cynical. We kind of need some hope right now. We we? do, we do. (laughs) Um, This is what I believe. And again, a lot of my concepts started in the classroom. Um, I absolutely believe that when we create a community or or a culture that is inviting, someone can find their space in it. It does not mean that there 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 still won't be challenges, and it's not going to be perfect. But I really believe that if we create a culture where there is, you know, I always say I don't need everybody. I just need a critical mass. Not everybody on the same page. Yeah. Everybody's not going to be on the same page. No, but no. if we can tip it, yeah, if we can tip it so that there's a critical mass, I really feel like um, there can be a difference made and we can hold space for people. I saw it in my classroom and that's just a small, you know, uh, sample size, if you will, of what I would want for the entire world or organizations. But I saw students who struggled with a number of different things but because of what I created or attempted to create in my classroom you know they at least would come have a private conversation with me and I would I would be able to as objectively as possible but at the same time invite you know as inviting as impossible 
hold space for everybody. And that created, oh my goodness, such beautiful conversations where people had aha moments because they at least felt comfortable enough to share their truth, even if they didn't think everybody else would agree with it. Right. And the work that I do is is long term to do one off like program here, program there. Usually it's two years, three years. Um, I've worked with with organizations for as long as six years because mm-hmm. what we're talking about can't be resolved in a program. It can't be resolved, you know, even in a couple of trainings. Um, yeah. And the organizations that I found that are most successful to your question are organizations that did a couple of things at the same time. Yes, we did audits and they looked at their pro- their policies and all of that, but we also worked really hard on culture. And the surveys that I did along the way showed progress, not just in, you know, having ADA, you know, um, accessible um, bathrooms and all of the things mm-hmm. that they worked on, but it was shifts where people said, you know, I hadn't thought about this particular topic in that way. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Now I know how to have a hard conversation, even with myself. So again, I don't have a hard, fast answer. Like, I don't know that anybody does. No. But I've seen, I've seen real work with people applying that empathy because I believe empathy is a pathway to everyday equity. You know, thinking about reflecting on themselves, learning to have the hard conversations. And I've seen real shifts. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and your students coming to you just to disclose things like that just reinforces that you created that safe space for them at the, where they, mm-hmm. um, they knew that you valued them and you saw them and you, uh, and you would listen to them without judgment. Um, and so that Absolutely. really says a lot. And if organizations can do that, even to a small extent, um, you know, they'll see the the benefits, you know, of of it in the employee satisfaction um and and a lot more mm-hmm. so thank you absolutely so i know that was a very complex question <laughs> but i was like it, it just popped in my head as you were talking oh. about, you know so <laughs> um so let's talk about no, intersectionality I love the question for sure oh, and i you. will say oh i'm sorry yes. no no go ahead um i'm gonna mute myself while i cough so keep keep uh keep talking Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think, I think too, what's important about, you know, even what we were just talking about is there were a number of things happening at once. And yeah. I can't stress the importance of that enough, right? That we are looking at language and we're looking at mm-hmm. our handbooks and we're looking at the way that we're carrying out these policies, because that also speaks to valid, you know, whether or not you value your staff, that also speaks to you know, the values of the organization. I can tell you that one of, one of the clients that I worked with um, who actually has won awards for their work started out with, you know, just saying, Hey, can you come on? It's like, yes, we, we agreed to, to three years because again, that long-term process for me is what's important. And Mm -hmm. over the three years, we did consistent trainings monthly um, you know, they they rewrote their mission statement to match their their DEI um, B values. They, um, you know, I had trainings with their board. So it was a number of different things nice. in addition to reshaping that culture. And I'm telling you the 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 strides that they made over the three years not only shifted their entire organization, but people in their industry was like, they were like, what are you doing? Like, tell us um, yeah. how you're changing. That to me is such a, it's a beautiful example of what we can be. Yeah, that yeah. is a great example. I mean, because when others see the success in what, um, of the initiatives, um, mm-hmm. they, they don't know what what they did, but they just see a change and a positive change. <clears throat> And um, and it does get noticed and they, they do inquire. And so that's a great word of mouth um, advertising, actually, <laughs> and, yeah, and, and um, show of success. Absolutely. So let's talk about intersectionality and inclusivity. Um, how does intersectionality intersect with the concept of everyday equity 
And why is it important to center intersectional perspectives in equity efforts? Um, good question. I've not had this question, so this is a really good one. <laughs> um, you know what I think everyday equity does? I think it's important to our understanding and thinking about intersectionality because, again, it makes us have empathy and think about the whole person, right? Mm-hmm. All How all identities intersect. I think I think there's a missed opportunity when we only look at groups separate from how their identities intersect. We miss mm-hmm. an opportunity um, in terms of resources, in terms of voice. We miss an opportunity in terms of understanding. One of the um, gosh, one of the TED talks that I love, and you might have seen this, um, Chimamanda Adichie. Does that name sound mm-hmm. familiar no. to you all? Yeah, Please. share that link with me uh, when when you're done. <laughs> I'm going to share that link with you and you can get it to your listeners. She is an amazing, um, I don't want to, I don't know if she's, she's a writer. I don't think she's a historian, but she's a writer. She did this amazing TED talk called the danger of a single story. And the, the purpose of her TED talk speaks to your question that when we only see one, you know, when we only see an individual in, in terms of their one identity, then we it, it creates this vacuum so that we're inserting stereotypes and ideas. And she is from Nigeria, but then came to America for school. And mm-hmm. she talks about, you know, how people perceived her as a woman from Nigeria um, and how all of her identities shape her thinking and her storytelling and her writing. And it's dangerous when we see an individual only as one identity. I yeah. said all of that to say, for me, everyday equity causes us to pause and think about individuals, not just within groups, mm-hmm. but also as who they are in all the ways that their identities intersect. Right. So for me, and I give this example often, I identify as a black woman and I'm from Appalachia. A lot of people can talk about, you know, what what their thoughts are about me as a black woman. But for me, as a black woman in Appalachia, that was something that I would talk about often because it, it shaped me. That community is very much a part of who I am. You can, you know bring a black woman, someone who identifies as a black woman from New York, we're not, we're not necessarily going to be the same because Mm -hmm. I was shaped also by region. So I don't want to babble on and on, but the point that I want to make, and I think this is so important. And so that's why I thank you for the question. For me, everyday equity to see someone as a neighbor, it is to see again, all of who they are. Yes. Part of various groups, but individual and unique because of all of the identities that intersect to make up, you know, who they are. I love that um, because everybody has a different story, different experiences uh, because of all their identities and uh, uh, what they've, um, where they've lived and uh, who they've been around. Um, uh, So judging someone just by what they look like on the outside um, mm-hmm. is done more often than we'd like to think, <laughs> but, yes. um, or judging someone f- just, f- uh, from their religion or where the what country they might be from. Uh, I mm-hmm. mean, just think of the United States. I mean, uh, you move from one state to another or one city to another, it's a whole different mm-hmm. culture. Uh, That's there's different, right. the slang words, uh, you know, people, uh, have different, uh, behaviors. It's the same in every country. Um, no, I mean, so we cannot stereotype, oh, he's from uh, Iraq or she's from Iraq, um, you know, and so they're, they're Muslim, they're this, they're this, they're this, it's like, they may be Christian, you know, <laughs> it's like, right. that's uh, exactly I mean, right. yeah, it's that's like right. they, they may have been from Iraq, but maybe uh, they were born and their parents were born in Morocco, uh, you know, that's it's right. like, you, you don't know, it's like, <clears throat> they're because people emigrate all over. The, the world these That's days right. and um and have for centuries actually um so it's mm-hmm. um uh to make these assumptions uh which is a human tendency <laughs> uh because sure, sure. um, as we know the the brain you know we see one thing and it, it just boom automatically stereotypes 
um, to understand that about ourselves, to self-assess ourselves and our implicit biases. Um, mm -hmm. If we self-assess ourselves, then we can pause before we say something and respond or or act on something. Um, so asking like an individual like, oh, you know, you're, you, uh, you speak Spanish. Can you translate this? There's this different dialects. Um, right. So, <laughs> same with, uh, same with um, uh, Arabic. There's so many different dialects of Arabic um, in right. a lot of different countries. I mean, there's different dialects of English too, you know? Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah. It's, can I give you the other side of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is for me. This is the other side of that that speaks to everyday equity. Yes, the assumptions and and the the microaggressions that can, the implicit bias that can come from all of those things, but also for me, everyday equity says there are so many commonalities that we miss. There is a richness right, of relationship, a, rich, a richness of conversation that we can miss out on mm -hmm. if if we just tell a single story about an individual, yeah. you, right? So yeah. if, you know, you think about it from an organizational perspective, often we have this divisiveness because we, you know, we only look at whether she's Black or religion or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever those demographics are. But the, the positive, the asset building part of that, which is what I focus on, is what kind of commonality can we have? Okay, yes, mm -hmm. I identify as this and you identify as that. But because we are, there are these intersecting identities, maybe you grew up in a small town and that's enough for us to have a common you know, understanding mm -hmm. about. Or maybe, maybe there's some other thing that that we have in common. And I think that's what um, Adichie points out in a da The Danger of a Single Story, that when we have these stereotypes, they create more division. Whereas if we try to understand the whole person, we're bound <clears throat> to find some commonalities that will really help create community. And that's what yeah. I think is powerful. I agree. I agree. Um... It reminds me of that uh, one video that's um, on YouTube and different places on the internet. I don't know if it's a Dutch video uh, from uh, Holland or what what country I can't remember, but um, where uh, all these different people are in a group in some warehouse room, and the speaker says, "Okay, uh, step forward or raise your hand if you uh, are from a uh, your parents are divorced. Step forward or raise your hand if you um, uh, are uh, a single parent." Um, or if you're the middle child, or if you were the class clown, you know, it's like, so, uh, and it lets people see like, oh, you know, it's like, <laughs> it automatically builds that, um, like, especially uh, like something, something like the class clown, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> like, you know, it builds <laughs> that, um, that um, camaraderie, you know, in a sense, like um, that uh, right. connection and, um, and it's, um, it's almost like somebody erased, uh, everything else of uh and that's what they they see now and uh yes. so it, it it's an impactful video you've probably seen it before mm -hmm. um and uh but it, it's uh videos like that i love videos like that because they mm -hmm. have such an impactful message that um really can open up someone's eyes uh to all yeah we're different but we're we have a lot of differences but we have a lot of similarities and it's Absolutely. um and uh besides the differences and similarities the basis is we're all human we're all part of the human race we're all we're on this planet we need uh we should um learn to live together um in harmony uh mm -hmm. treating each other as we we would like to be treated or as others would like you know as people would like to be treated um mm -hmm. and um if we're gonna uh make you know be successful as a, as a race. Uh -huh. So, and you know what? It's Circling crazy. all the way back around for me, the 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 thing that fits that the most is the orchestra or the band. Right? Everybody's mm -hmm. playing different instruments, yeah. but they're all in sync. Sometimes you play in unison. Sometimes you know there's dissonance, but it all creates this beautiful sound. And so we were joking before we came yeah. on for me, all of the fundamental principles that I learned, I learned in the band, but, yeah. um, but it's absolutely true. And guess what? Whenever, you know, I, I wasn't in the orchestra, but I was in the band. I played the trombone. 
there were times when certain sections would be featured, right? There would be times when, mm-hmm. when certain sections would be solos yeah. or when they, they have would, the, they would, yeah, they have the, the theme music. Exactly. Yeah. But it takes everybody playing yeah. for that, that music to, to sound the way that it, that it did all, but because all voices needed to be heard. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, that encapsulates the way I think about DEIB. All voices need to be heard. It doesn't mean that if I need to hear more of the the trump the low brass section that I don't want to hear the flutes, mm-hmm. the, you know the 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 uh, wind instruments. I need to hear them all. Yeah. And if I don't hear them, I mean, I can see my band director now. Back in the day, she had hand motions. She did what was necessary, right, like, to make like sure really that we the sound. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. I, you just had me a flat. Know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but you know, that didn't mean that she didn't want to hear from the other sections. That's my point. She needed to hear from everybody. For me, that's what I do. I'm the conductor. You're the, con- you know, we're conductors yes. making sure that all voices are heard. Yeah. And all instruments are, are working um, as best yeah. as they can and, um, yeah. and get repaired when needed. <laughs> get that TLC. <laughs> there you go. That's it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I love that analogy. I usually use the the cooking analogy. Uh, like, um you have, uh, we've all had bland food, uh, Mm -hmm. but um, what makes it great is all the spices you put in and all the different types of ingredients to where it, it has a harmony of flavor and it just all comes together and it, Mm -hmm. it's just right. (laughs) It's not too salty, not too bland. (laughs) Yes. I love it. I love it. (laughs) Cool. I want to be constant of your time. So let me uh, do some key takeaways very quickly. So we talked about um, everyday equity mindset. We um, talked about the concept of everyday equity and how it involves recognizing and valuing the humanity and dignity of all individuals, regardless of their differences. Uh, We talked about demystifying equity um, and uh, the notion that creating equitable opportunities is complex or demystifying the notion that creating equitable opportunities is complex or inaccessible. We talked about community building and neighborliness, um, about the importance of fostering a sense of community and neighborliness and promoting equity and inclusion. We talked about intersectionality and inclusivity, recognizing that intersectionality of identities and experiences and its significance in understanding and addressing inequities. And um, we will be talking about, um, I will be having some action-oriented um, solutions for um, uh, our listeners. So next steps that they could uh, possibly uh, take, I will put that um, in the summary for um, some things that you can do to reflect and engage, build relationships, take action, stay informed, and, and amplify your voice. So um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, if you can include, uh, send me that link, I would definitely, I'll definitely include that in, in some of the, the um, uh, um learning like um staying informed section i will for sure um thank you so h- how can listeners get a hold of you get contact you if they want uh to contact you for services or uh, contact you for a speaking engagement or to collaborate on a book yeah i love it um so in terms of social media it's all at matisa wilbin so you can find me there um instagram Twitter, even if people are still on Facebook, I'm on there as well. Um, on LinkedIn, it's Matisa Wilbin PhD. So same, Matisa Wilbin PhD. Or folks can um, email me at info at Matisa Wilbin. And my website uh, is the same, matisawilbin.com. Okay. So if you got my and, name, you, you can get in contact with me. Yeah, because I believe your LinkedIn your has the contact info of a lot of the, that stuff as well. So yeah. I will be putting a slide at the end of today's uh, podcast uh, with all of my, uh, Dr. Wilben's information uh, of, of how she said she can uh, you can contact her if you are interested in reaching out to her to uh, um, help your organization uh, in their DEI efforts or um, invite her for a uh, speaking engagement um, at an event or a um, or collaborate on a book. So thank you awesome. so much, Dr. Wilbin. It was wonderful speaking with you. I could, I could, I, I'm, I'm sad that we have to cut it short, uh, but I know you have a, another appointment, so um, I could speak about this all day. So um, I know this was this was such an easy conversation. I'm looking down like, oh, it's you. time already. <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> um, you are welcome back anytime. Um, as I said, I can talk about this all day. I, it's it's um, I'm very passionate about this um, uh, DEI uh, topic, uh, different topics and initiatives. So um, and just having these conversations, because the more we talk about it in a positive light and uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, the more impactful it can be and hopefully spread um, uh, across the globe in um, the amount of listeners who uh, people who will listen and hopefully um, it'll impact them uh, positively and they'll start spreading Absolutely. the love. <laughs> I agree, 100%. Well, I'm going to stop recording then. Oh, and for listeners, stay tuned for our uh, next podcast. Um, it'll be every podcast is released um, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Dr. Matisse's will be released um, in a few weeks. Um, I will be putting um, uh, it on social media uh, to advertise when they will be released. So thank you so much. and make a difference. And as always, for more strategies on building inclusive workplaces and communities, check out Diversity. We're here to guide you on your DEI journey. Make sure to visit our website at diversities.com and follow us on social media for the latest happenings, blog posts, tips, and events.